Uma Kalker is a powerhouse. Seriously, she's an artist and an electric engineer who draws a powerful connection between the two. And her approach not only helps us face major challenges like art block or taking feedback too personally, but also empowers us to keep on creating without the ongoing feeling of guilt and powerlessness that haunts so many of us. If this piqued your curiosity, then stay tuned as we discuss how to set realistic art goals, overcoming art block, why Uma believes everyone is born an artist, and how to control temperature when painting in watercolor. Want to be part of the show? Then send in your questions or topics you'd like to see covered to our email at hello at etrelab.com. If you send us an audio recording, we might include it in the episode. Hi, I'm Anya, and this is Make More Art, a podcast by Etra, meant to inspire you to keep on creating. Now let's hear from our guest. What came first, being an engineer or being an artist? They're the same. Uh-huh. Good engineers are good artists, and good artists engineer their way. Um, but from a finance and education point of view, engineering came first. Okay. Only because traditionally it takes a longer runway. Okay. So you can't call yourself an engineer until you have gone 21 years in school. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, that is true. So you invest, you invest in it first. Um, and then painting has come up as a serious vocation and passion later. So were you not one of those super artsy kids that were painting all the time? Were you more of a builder, thinker? I, I was a very lazy kid. I tried not to do anything, absolutely. <laughs> no, it is true. I think uh, a lot of my inventions have come about from not wanting to do the work in the first place. But <laughs> uh, So you're a genius. Okay, noted. No, no, no. What I meant to say is I did love to art as a kid, but somewhere the conditioning from the society kicked in where Mm. it wasn't what was going to pay the bills down the hill. So it was nice and pretty, but it wasn't, it was assumed that it wasn't, it wasn't going to foster a strength and future. Where did you grow up? I grew up in India. Okay, so it's kind of worldwide that art is not a job. But how heavy is that in India? I mean, it's like it's such a colorful and beautiful country. And just saying it out loud that also their art is not considered. And I don't know, it's just, it's sad. Absolutely. It's a complex country and very varied culture. And things have changed. It also comes, my background also comes from a particular condition of the family, right? Mm -hmm. So if the family couldn't have afforded paying bills for the artist school, that also conditions your path. So not everybody is like this. With the dances and the food and the temple sculptures, art abounds in India, but art abounds as a collective. Mm-hmm. And not as a single person. So you don't have a sculptor signing their name on a sculpture in India when you make, mm-hmm. like, just like when you make churches. and mm-hmm. That temples. does make sense. So even though you loved art from a young age, you knew that was not going to be a career option. Right. And also I realize, I realize now looking back, I make choices Uh, dependent on respect and I didn't think art was going to get as much respect Um, and I imbibed it correctly I did see that engineers were respected more Um, I had not figured out the gender thing then but I did see that the engineers when they came home were served tea and got food (laughs) <laughs> and they had gone to work all day and come back home and taken care of. I'm like, I want to be that. And but I were they all men? Them. Sorry. Yes, they happened okay. to be all men. Yes. Okay. At that point. And uh, so I said, oh, I would like that too. It seems easy to work with non-living things, machines. 
And was it? Oh yeah, it's a lot of fun. Okay, so it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it, you okay? You enjoyed being an engineer. It was not sure if there was the respect aspect, the culture of it, and you wanted to do right by your family. So you went down that path because of those reasons. Plus, you really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I still enjoy it, and I think there is a lot of value in engineering that artists can get and a lot of value in art that engineers can get. I'm really passionate about cross-pollination. Can you please expand a little bit on that? So people know who follow me on Instagram that I have this label called I paint like an engineer. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly to foster this dialogue. Um, for example, um, what is the value engineering can give art engineering can give art the not just art but artists the ability to have discipline and ability of process and i'll explain so i engineers don't have an artist block mm -hmm. if they don't feel like it there is never an excuse i don't feel like it so i won't solve this problem mm -hmm. right <laughs> there, there is a problem this is the need of times and you grow up, you adult up and you deal with it. Oh, my child is sick. Okay. You get some other help or work around the problem and yeah, face it. it. Work. Yeah. yeah. And if it doesn't work, you don't say it's too hard. I have to go home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's no, it's just too hard. So you keep on collaborating, figuring out path A, path B, path C, you keep on researching. Mm -hmm. And once you research and you figure out after maybe 25 days, you've solved the problem and it has solved and has improved not only your life, but other people's life, mm -hmm. you start trusting the process of just doing this. Mm -hmm. And that also you can take to art. When sometimes you are trying to make a painting and you get frustrated, mm -hmm. um, I trust the process. Actually, the process went from art to science, but I also trust uh, dissection of it in the sense when sometimes paintings don't fail, I have found a lot of artists get frustrated with themselves and say and feel bad and even cry saying it's a reflection of themselves. Yeah, right. It's the I suck and not this piece of art sucks. They take it right. very personally. It's me exactly. who's a piece yes. of doo doo. Instead yes. of, I did something that is not worth anything. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it's a huge deal. I mean, we, these sentences sound like juvenile, like high school kids saying this, mm -hmm. but this is actual internal mental block a lot of people have, and then they stop pushing. Mm -hmm. I have never heard an engineer say, um, I suck. The, pro the sentence I have heard is, oh, what went wrong? Yeah. There's always Problem a postmortem, what went wrong? And you state the problem. And when you state the problem, and sometimes it's also a personal problem. So it's not always an engineering thing. Like, oh, he mm -hmm. and I did not collaborate together. That is a people problem. But you say it. Mm -hmm. And once you say it, whether even if you don't solve it, it's out in the open. It is outside yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there is hope. It's very hope giving. So why do you think that engineers, and when we say and engineers, because it's so close to you, but I'm thinking engineers, doctors, lawyers, anyone whose job is considered by the society as a quote unquote real job. Mm. It looks to me that they all have this in common, which is like, there's a problem, then that means I have to find the best solution to solve it. So there's an mm. externalization of the problem. Why mm. do you think in art, mm. it, that does not happen? I don't know the answer, but I can take a guess at the answer. Mm -hmm. When we make art ours, I'll mm -hmm. give you an example of, of, of cameras. You have a camera, I have a camera, we look at the same scene. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have the same input, same out, similar output, same media. Now, what do we change when we click? The only change comes out from your feelings. It only change comes from what you want to achieve internally and your emotions. Mm -hmm. So in painting, I'm painting to, painting is a language. I'm speaking to you. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking to other people. And sometimes I'm just speaking loudly and people who can hear my message like my art. Mm -hmm. Because I draw flowers, every other person draws flowers 
draws flowers, for example. But why do we like one style of flower? Because we read something more than just the subject. Yeah? So mm -hmm. we are allowed in art to bring our feelings. And our feelings are definitely not external. They are ours and we make it, make it very personal. We are sharing our soul with every piece we depart wow. with. Beautifully put. And this is why when someone criticizes someone's art, a lot of artists take it personally because they are exposing themselves in a way that is very private and vulnerable. Very private. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. While being an engineer, that does not exist. It's very logical. What kind of engineer, what kind of engineering are you referring to? For those, uh, those of our listeners who do not know you, what kind of engineering do you do? I'm an electrical engineer. I design high speed circuits. So circuits for fiber optics and communication and uh, things like that. So every for every word at one point, the company I used to work for um, that passed in Facebook, one, one in five words was passing through chips that we designed, for example. Mm -hmm. And would you consider that job to be very logical or do you think there's a degree of emotion in it? Correct. So I was, I'm glad you asked that question because it's not that engineers don't have any emotions. Of course. Every engineer is not just seeking a solution. When you say best solution, we do have parameters like oh, best in power, best in size, smallest, shortest time to market. Yes. But there is something that all engineers will, all humans will like. There is something called elegance in solution. Mm -hmm. When you find an elegant solution, everybody's eyes go whoop. And that delight, that gloating right you have, you know, in painting to when you solve something yourself, you're like, whoa, I know how to do that. <laughs> I think engineers feel that all the time. Um, sometimes the actualization takes two years, three years. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely that is an emotion to, f to feel that you have found a nicer way that... Um, maybe saves world resources or something mm -hmm. like that. But even so, dealing with the problems and the struggles that comes with being an engineer, which is more, more of a logical kind of job than being an artist, it's, yeah, so that's the difference between being an engineer and being an artist. While art is like 90% emotion, 10% logic, and I'm not saying this is correct, but for many people it is, then being an engineer is kind of the opposite, where there's a lot of problem solving in logical thinking and a slice of emotion in it. And it looks to me that what you're saying is that you are able to recognize how being logical about problem solving is so helpful to your working process as an engineer and then you exported that to your art process right and now you're able even though you're feeling all the emotion because we're all humans all of us have yeah. feelings i'm married to right. a software engineer he has a lot of feelings i i, I, I with him <laughs> saying he's a robot from time to time but he, he gave me donuts for mother's day he totally has the best feelings <laughs> ever uh so so yeah so you kind of built the bridge between the logic and the emotion so and you're, I've never seen anyone talking about engineering with such emotion as well. So that's, yeah, that's very beautiful. Okay, so can you, you have this uh, philosophy the, about problem solving that you apply to being an artist. Can you explain a little bit about that as well? Ah, so there were times when people were asking me to explain this process of interlinking things and coming to a solution from different sides. Mm -hmm. And I made a cartoon uh, using a cards, a house of cards. And I understand this is a podcast, but for people who would like visuals, I know Anya is going to put up visuals on her YouTube channel when mm -hmm. the podcast gets shown. So exactly. you could see the house of cards. The and house uh, of cards. Just one side, guys. You can grab the link for that at etcherlab.com forward slash Uma. We will link to uh, the YouTube version. Perfect. A house of cards is built by taking two cards, two playing cards, and propping them against each other in a triangle to make a teepee. And then you make many such teepees and you build on top of it. Mm -hmm. And I think of these teepees as a skill. 
to build a house of cards or build a strength in anything, I show that you have to build on your existing skills, but your existing skills base has to widen. When I say base has to widen, how, how does the base of a drawing widen? You have to practice either more or more variety, but you just have to keep on fixing the foundation. Mm -hmm. And the key element in that house of cards is every time you build all these TPs, there is, a, there is a time in the practice of art when the structure does not grow in height. You have to put these flat slabs on top of these teepees. These flat slabs are understanding how one skill, let's say a drawing skill, or let's go to even basic, how do values, mm -hmm. if you're talking about paintings, will connect with temperature, which is another skill you might have had. Mm -hmm. or pigment and hue and saturation how do they all melt with each other mm -hmm. and this just thought process how do i use one over the other or how do i leverage one just this thought process or making up examples for yourselves to figure out what is the inherent hierarchy in my in my hierarchy values win but what is you have to do absurd experiments to figure out what works together and when you are doing these absurd experiments and studies, many months pass. And to you and to the outside world, it looks like you have produced nothing. Mm -hmm. This is where people give up. Mm -hmm. This is where the house of cards doesn't grow. But without this structure, I am saying that when the next level that you build will not be of a higher quality. On a house of cards, you can't put a TP on top of a TP without that flat structure. Mm -hmm. uh, the, that that was the key that you have you build separate skills but now you have to find the interlocking of these skills so they stay strong and they can also feed off each other's strengths and then the show was that to build more and more house of cards a, a taller and taller structure you can't just keep on building on one on top of the other you have Every time you want to expand one level up, you also have to expand the base by a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So the work required, so if you have a three tier house of cards, you still have to add something on the first level, then the second level, then the third level. So the work does not reduce ever. But what does reduce is because of the process, because you have seen that first two levels were built successfully and they're standing without a problem mm -hmm. you have gotten an inherent confidence you build mm -hmm. that intuition you now start trusting the process that even if it looks slow it's gonna happen yeah so that's what the process gives you because sometimes of course life gets tough and sometimes it's re it really sucks to build something which doesn't look like it's going anywhere mm -hmm. but if you have done it in a small piece a house of cards is just three levels. Then the fourth level, it comes and you start trusting the process. Yeah. And this is where patience and trust really go the long way. And correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, one way that at least that I found to not get discouraged because it happens to me all the time, especially now with all the life changes I had with having a kid and not doing any art and then mm. the art kind of wobbles down. Sometimes I feel like I'm not not only not making progress or I feel like I'm regressing or going back, that's when I pause and look at the art that I made two years ago and compare it to whatever that I'm doing now and I see the growth. And right. that gives me renowned confidence on that process that you're describing. Wonderful. And for that to happen, you did an excellent, you brought up an excellent point. You did a great thing. You have to track. So that's, the engineering thing you have to track your pro you have to track every day you don't have to look back on the entire thing mm -hmm. every day maybe every six months or once a year but tracking your art or just upload it to Flickr, make it private don't even have to look at it don't have to share it but if it's there your 300 paintings at the end of the year mm -hmm. you get to see your journey and you get to see that you really want to see the downs too because you were down and then you came up oh so that's confidence building that even if nobody saw, I have the power in me. Wow. To recover. Wow. 
human beings are such wonderful things. See, you were asking me before we started the recording, how do I get this energy? Like you get, you give me this energy. This is amazing. Uh, I love these interviews. Uh, one thing that you mentioned at the beginning of the interview that I thought it was really interesting is that you said in engineering, there's no quote unquote art block. There's a problem. So there's no solution. And I'll just give up and go home. Mm. And we talked about the being super emotional about art and be making it so personal that it's easy to step down. Now, what are your thoughts about? So professional, let me put it this way. Professional artists uh, have told me that they do not have art block because art is their job. They have to show up and they have to do it whether they feel inspired or not. Okay. And the way that they found to keep on trucking is, hey, This is my routine. I get up, I feed the kid, leave him at school, come home from X to Y. It's my art time. Whether I'm inspired or not, that doesn't matter. I have to make art, so I do it. So creating a routine over time helps the body to create habits to get into the creative space. You know, we can teach Absolutely. ourselves, we can teach ourselves pretty much everything. Being creative at that time, napping, because my husband closes his, high, his eyes and he naps. Just naps. Wow. And I was talking to a therapist about that and she was like, yeah, we can train ourselves to do that. We can train ourselves to do pretty much anything as long as we practice. Um, so I think that this uh, art block issue with artists comes a little bit from the fact that maybe we're not taking it seriously enough or trying hard enough to create the habits that will make the strong foundations, like you put it. Hmm. Hmm. I agree. I agree. By the way, if your husband can nap like that, that is a superpower. I will connect with him on the side so that I want to be able to take quick breaks too and full efficiency. It's amazing. It, it saved the first stages of having a kid because I couldn't sleep, but he could. So when I was completely <laughs> dead, he was like, I'll take over. I'm like, okay, go super dude. Can I read to you uh, a quote I just recently learned about, it's not exactly about art blocks, but what happens in the human psyche when we, uh -huh. art block is some kind of resistance, correct? Yes, I love this conversation. So this is a quote from Jane Hirschfeld, and she's mm -hmm. an American poet. And she says this, if we demand change too insistently in art or in the self, something grows stubborn and digs in its heels. But within presence and lightness of being, we can open into the new way. It may be that originality is simply what you step out of the way of. It is what must come if the old ways are dropped and discarded like clothes. What I meant to say, if there is a block, I would like to question if you're trying to force yourself to change too much and go somewhere. There are two parts of going somewhere. One is to leave destination A, mm -hmm. but you can leave destination A and have no plan for B. If that is the personality you have, and I, I do like to have semi-ambiguous plans. Mm. Because if it's too monitored and too regimented, I feel I'm boxed in, which is mm -hmm. exactly what I don't want. And that, that's where my resistance often comes because I am trying to paint something in an X way. Mm -hmm. So instead of putting two conditions that I have to paint, for, paint from eight to nine and the painting has to be from this and this, I take off one condition. Mm -hmm. So I do not take away bounds of time. I want mm -hmm. that habit to stay but mm -hmm. I don't give myself a direction right away sometimes mm -hmm. because I, I sense my body is resisting. My mind is not ready to go. It will have to go on its own. So you let the mind play. Very interesting. You know, for me, it works. If I have more details, it works best. When I've made the most progress in my book was when I'm like, okay, I'm going to work from uh, nine to 10 Mm. or nine to 12, let's say like that, nine to 12, I'm going to work on my book. And today my goal is to mm. make thumbnails for two spreads minimum. It would be awesome if I can do four, but I will be happy with very roughs for the first two. So I give myself a smaller goal 
that I can easily reach. I get that kick of dopamine and then I easily Perfect. make more spreads. So it's very interesting how you can set that depending on how your psyche works, like you were saying. Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly right. You said, I will be happy with three, four would be perfect. But setting yourself, giving yourself the permission to do less. And I also would like to add to that. And the reason I suspect you do it and I do it or anybody else does it because A, we, we trust ourselves that this is a passing phase. Mm -hmm. That even if I go into the dips, I have to go through to come out the other sides and tomorrow it'll be better. Mm -hmm. And if I'm having a complete art block, I will work anyway from eight to nine, let's say if that's my schedule time, mm -hmm. to enable tomorrow. So, okay, zero output today, but how can I make sure if that 15 minutes from every day for the next seven days is saved? Or even if not, even if I've saved nothing from tomorrow, by having fun today, I am primed to play tomorrow. So play is what I call about play and free play is some same as what tinkering is in engineering. Mm -hmm. And when you free play, sometimes you find solutions in the rough. And what this, you might not be tackling this problem right now, but you get these jewels of information. Oh, I didn't know burnt sienna when sprinkled on cerulean blue when it's wet, it does that. And it gets stored away somewhere in your memory. So you start building this repository of, of intuition. Mm -hmm. And then when a new problem strikes, somehow you have this confidence that maybe I'm going to try it this way because all that stored up intuition comes to play. Mm -hmm. How does that help in engineering? In engineering, the longer you're an engineer, your projects get bigger and you start becoming risk covers because if you make a bad mistake at the 90th, like at the end of the project, you're going to cost. Yeah. But a problem comes up. And if you have tinkered in engineering too, and if you're tinkered somewhere where you've played and you've found some weird solutions to something that was not a problem right now, um, then when you're faced with a real problem, your intuition kicks in. Yeah, and it it suddenly give makes makes you little risk makes you averse to taking a risk. Okay. Um, so having fun is actually important to engineering too, is what I'm trying to say. Because mm -hmm. at that moment, figuring out ten thousand ways of solving the problem is going to be very scary. It takes money. It takes time. Yeah. But when you're having when you're playing, there is no need to have a solution to any problem. You're just playing. But mm -hmm. solutions just jump out of that play. And they are solutions to some a problem that you don't know you're going to face. So they just stay as happy moments in your brain. So it's in another, so in, in a sense, it's like if you're allowing yourself to have fun, you are kind of unlocking the way that your brain makes connections. Because if you are relaxed and you're absorbing a lot of information, then your brain is automatically able to create those connections that will give you the creative kinds of solutions. This is a question that I've been seeing a lot lately. What do you think about, can anyone become an artist? True or false? Everybody's born artist, true. Why? If you can see beauty, sense beauty, enjoy beauty, you're an artist. Wow. If it makes you happy to see a flower, it makes you happy when a child smiles, you're responding to that beauty. There is no transaction there. there you're, nobody's giving you anything. The flower is giving you nothing other than just being. And if you can respond to that saying, wow, you're an artist, you got it. That's the what, sense of life. What is art for you? Oh my God, my medicine, I'd die without it. Uh, Art is my drug. I'll die. I would die without it. And that this is how we create a... <laughs> Art is a language for me. Art is my healer, my psychotherapist. Art is so much more. It tells me to step back. Um... And because it has no goal, end point in the sense, not no goal, 
it has a reason, but there's no end point. You can always refine it. Mm -hmm. It's a great companion. So it will not let me be alone. It will always be there to pursue. Wow. What's your favorite medium? Watercolors. And uh, what do you love the most about watercolor? Oh, they don't want to behave. Uh, <laughs> the number one reason why people either love or completely hate watercolor. Oh, no, absolutely. Trying to wield power over something that wants to run away, uh, the challenge. Uh, well, okay, that's just me getting all uh, uh, combative, poetic. but not uh, poetic, but where you joust for things where you like to be challenged. Mm -hmm. There's a word that I forget. But the other reason I like watercolors is because of the glow. It's a semi-transparent medium. So there's mm -hmm. some glow. You just can't explain. if you And you have to see a watercolor in life. Not somehow the technology doesn't do it. But when you see a watercolor live on paper, it, it emits light. And it's like, oh, it speaks more. I'm like, how could that artist? Every time you see somebody's painting, it's like, how did that, how did that happen? How could he do it? How did wow. you do it? What is this magic? <laughs> it's life. Uh, so far, what has been your biggest struggle with watercolor and how did you, how did you face it? Uh, controlling temperature. Any tips? Some, yes, a lot of active looking. You have to first figure out what the overall temperature of your piece is. There is no temperature of just one thing. Of course, there is minor areas, right? If you have a highlight on a warm thing, usually the highlight will be cooler, which is very mm -hmm. counterintuitive. So, but you have to actively look to see that. But you also have to now figure out the temperature of the whole piece. And so your first washes have to have a temperature gradient to it. Your first so, basic glaze that you do, if people do. Yeah. So if you're going for a warmer kind of piece, you would want to go for a warmer first wash tone just to set the whole mood for the painting from the get-go. Correct. It especially is important in all transparent media because of the glow, I said. So mm -hmm. even the lower layers show through. And because you have a common temperature across, mm -hmm. it becomes a harmonizing or equalizing variable. So it holds the piece to the better. That makes a lot of sense. Beautiful tip. Um, and before we wrap up this interview that is full of pearls, you will be doing a live demo with us in the near future. Yes, soon. We're working on the date, but yes. And I'm quite excited, not just quite, I'm very excited to be working yeah. with you and the team. Oh, thank you. For now, we have a tentative date, but just in case that schedule, that changes because we're recording this podcast still in January, uh, still in December, and um, Uma's live demo is scheduled for late January. Um, by the time this interview is out, you can see the final date in the link to join the live demo on the post associated with this episode at etralab.com forward slash Uma. That's U-M-A. By the way, your name means one in Portuguese. I'm sure you already knew that. Uh, like number Uma. Um, and um, so you will be doing a live demo with us uh, late January. And uh, the theme would be night landscapes in watercolor. So you will be doing like cityscapes in watercolor city, cityscapes. So you will be showing us how to achieve the glow while it's pitch dark outside. Exactly. I would like to think I'm going to explain the color of no light. Wow. I love how you just put that. We're going to, okay. So Uma is going to do something very magical. I'm very much looking forward for this right now, which is, a medium that is highly transparent based on light and with which is we're gonna paint without okay this is uh, i'm very much looking forward for this if you guys want to learn how to paint night cityscapes you definitely don't want to miss this a link for the live demo will be again on the post associated with this episode at etcherlab.com forward slash uma any last words before we part ways 
I would like to tell you what the HR podcast is doing for people listening. Uh, this is a long format of information exchange. And because you're having this exchange one-on-one -on -one without audience, people are saying very authentic and revealing themselves. And in revealing, they're revealing their strength and your strength to listen and to share. I think this is a great asset. A lot of us don't comment on it, but to hear other people's thought processes and how they did it, like um, James Gurney, how he taught himself and with a plan and Tuesday, Zoom, Wednesday, something. And when you realize that people really put in that hard work and it's, it's not easy for anybody, it is very inspiring and it's very grounding. So kudos for coming up with this format. At this time, we have this time in COVID to hear somebody else. And we can do it without accepting that we are listening to anybody. So the podcast gives you another permission to sneak in listening without saying, oh, I listen to a lot of people. <laughs> this Thank is you. Wonderful. That means a lot to me and I'm tearing up. I'm glad uh, if you're listening to the audio only, uh, I'm saved. Don't look at my red eyes over on YouTube. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Uma. That means... That means a lot to me because it's true. Sometimes it's hard to have a gauge on how many people are listening because of course many people listening and do not comment. And I do understand that because sometimes I'm reading comics and I, you know, sometimes I just leave a like and don't comment and we don't have likes for the podcast, just comments. Uh, so it, it means the world to me. So thank you. And it gives me a lot of strength to keep on doing this uh, episode, uh, this podcast for a, lo a long, long time. So thank you. Just adding a little note from Uma, when she called everyone who was born an artist, she asked me to add that artists, as we know, are predominantly creators of art. But artists wouldn't be great artists without consuming or feeling the art surrounding them. Judicia's consumption of art and emotions is also on the spectrum of art making. Each one of us who responds to beauty now only needs to find a medium to generate it as well. An observation, the best of anything is artful. Now a question for you. How do you approach art block? Let us know your tips in the comment section of the post associated with this episode at etrelab.com forward slash uma. That's E-T-C-H-R-L-A-B dot com forward slash U-M-A. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, simply let us know in the comment section below. If you're enjoying the podcast, please help us keep the show alive. You can subscribe and give us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts at etcherlab.com forward slash go forward slash Apple. Or if you're more of a YouTube viewer, please make sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our most recent videos. Sharing is caring and every little bit helps. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Until then, let's make more art.